Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about learning and gaining experience. You know, some things you ostensibly went to school for, but really just went because you have to by law and your parents made you. So you tried to get out of it by acting sick, or in my case anyway, you were sick because of stomach and anxiety issues. Ah, childhood memories. Anyway though, learning. No one comes right out of the gate being perfect. It takes time, effort, ingenuity, and maybe a little bit of luck to advance and get better. In the world of aviation, technological advancement brought about by learning and gaining experience brought us from barely flying for a few hundred feet, just barely off the ground, to hitting Mach 6.7 at 100,000 feet in just about 60 years. It's pretty amazing when you think about it that way. From the Wright brothers flying 852 feet on December 17, 1903, to the North American X-15 setting a record on October 3, 1967, that still stands today with the fastest flight by a manned aircraft at 4,520 miles an hour. In the realm of manned flight, we have hit a sort of wall, with the human body not really being able to withstand or handle these speeds or g-forces, but we do continue to make significant advances in unmanned flights, and ever more prevalent drones appear to be the future. The advancement that I want to look at today, though, occurred in the early 1940s, around 1941, in an area that the United States had been lacking pretty behind in, and that is jet propulsion technology. According to the NASA website, the U.S. government and U.S. military was kind of unaware of British and German research and testing into jet engine technology in the late 30s. Instead, the U.S. military wanted to focus on production of more practical and well-understood piston engine aircraft, which in the late 30s and early 40s made sense, what with the whole war going on. Luckily for the United States, though, they had an ally in Great Britain, and the two countries were actively sharing technological advancements and achievements. In mid to late 1940, a group of British scientists led by Henry Tizard would visit the United States to share in some of their research and advancements, this visit being dubbed the Tizard Mission. In this visit, the British provided information about their progress in the construction of a functional jet engine, which apparently interested the U.S. military enough that in April and or May 1941, U.S. Air Command General Henry H. Arnold was informed of Britain's progress on a jet aircraft that was almost ready to fly, and Arnold would go to see it in person, to see the first flight of the Gloucester E-2839, Britain's first ever jet aircraft. After seeing this fly, Arnold would manage to secure design schematics for the engine, and by September 1941, arrangements were made for General Electric to produce the engine, and by October 1941, an actual jet engine from Britain was flown over to America and it was to be given to General Electric to be studied and copied. America was diving headfirst into jet engine technology. And for this engine that they would be building, they needed a frame to go with it. Instead of just slapping the engine on an already existing frame, they wanted something specially designed for it. And for this design, the U.S. military would enlist Bell Aircraft in part because Bell was already near the GE plant where the engine was being made, so that just made things easier. By January 1942, Bell submitted and had a design accepted, the design that would be the first jet aircraft flown by the United States, and a design that honestly kind of sucked. This is the Bell P-59 Era Comet. Before that initial design was accepted for prototype production, the U.S. military began taking measures to ensure that this project would remain top secret. The first step they took was to give the plane a disguising name. The P-59 was actually already used on a different project, also by Bell. The original XP-59 was a twin-boom fighter, 
that used a contra-rotating pusher propeller system, an overall design not too dissimilar from the Volti XP-54 Swoose Goose that would appear a few years later. After Bell signed the contract for the Era Comet in September 1941, the original XP-59 was cancelled shortly thereafter, and the Era Comet was given that name in its place. And because, on paper anyway, the project was still a propeller-powered plane, if there were any prying eyes who happened to see those papers, it wouldn't draw suspicion. But to keep away any prying eyes from seeing the actual design itself in person as it was being constructed, Bell began basically working out of solitary confinement. First, they would start working out of an old Pierce Arrow factory, Pierce Arrow being a defunct car manufacturer that went out of business in 1938, and this was likely to give them a bit of cover, but apparently for the US military this still wasn't enough. They were then moved to a former Ford plant and worked out of the second floor. To further protect the project that lie within, the windows were welded shut, the glass was painted over, and guards would protect the building. So, they were basically working in a sealed-off, guarded, abandoned building. In these less-than-optimal conditions, Bell was also subject to a soft time crunch, external factors notwithstanding. The first completed prototype was to be ready in eight months' time, after the signing of the initial production contract on September 30th, 1941. Before America actually received a physical copy of the jet engine, and before Bell actually finished the design schematics. But because there were inevitable delays in the jet engine being copied and produced by GE, Bell didn't have to adhere to that initial eight-month time frame. If they did, the plane would have to be ready by May 30th, 1942. However, Bell only received the engines that they needed in August. The engine, known at this stage as the General Electric IA, was first fired up by GE in mid-April, not successfully flown or even successfully ran necessarily, but first fired. The engine would stall out, but they were close to having a running engine. The next month, the IA would manage to achieve a total thrust of 1,250 foot-pounds. Not great, but not terrible either for their first try. It was good enough for the P-59, though, and in August 1942, Bell received two of them to fit onto their frame. And as for that frame, Bell was also kind of flying blind here due to the incredible secrecy of the project. Bell certainly had experience in designing successful aircraft like with the P-39, but not experience in jet aircraft. While normally a company would use wind tunnels to test out their design on a small scale and make improvements there before making the actual production version, they were actually barred from doing so out of fear that it may leak to enemy nations. Later in prototype production, they were actually granted the use of wind tunnels, but only low-speed, low-tech wind tunnels. Still, despite working in basically a dungeon, Bell did manage to make a full-fledged aircraft. Measuring in at 11.84 meters long, 14.93 meters wide, and 3.76 meters tall, the P-59 generally looked like a plumper version of some of Bell's other fighters, the P-39 and P-63. In fact, at least in my opinion anyway, the P-59 looks pretty similar to the P-63 King Cobra a plane that only first flew in late 1942, but was being designed even before the P-59 was. It also retained a major hallmark of Bell's fighter designs, in having tricycle landing gear, and for the most part, the biggest difference between the P-59 and the P-39 or 63 was the wing placement due to the engines. On the P-39 and 63, the wings were low set, below the cockpit at the base of the fuselage. On the P-59, the wings were set more towards the middle of the fuselage, also just below the cockpit. This was because the air intakes for the two IA engines 
were present under the wings along the fuselage. Generally speaking, low-set wings do have less drag and thus better performance, but having the wings low-set and having air intakes under wing just wouldn't work out for the P-59. Moving the wings would give them the added room, but would likely also increase drag. Do keep that in mind. The engine exhaust would follow directly back from the intake and would fire out of the back of the wing next to the fuselage. This was an early, more proof-of-concept design here, so they probably didn't want anything wacky or overly complex. Other than the change in propulsion system and wing placement, the other major external change would come in the proposed armaments that basically looked like they slapped it on with little thought. There were four guns in the nose, three 50 caliber machine guns, and one 37 mm cannon. The three guns were on the right side of the nose, and the cannon was on the left. Little care seems to have been taken in their placement being asymmetrical and thus unappealing to me. This was because, though, early on, the armament was to be just two 37mm cannons in a symmetrical placement, but it was later changed to the other armament, and the original remaining 37mm cannon instead of being centered, was just left where it was. Still though, despite my annoyance, the plane was complete and ready to be shipped away for testing. But already, before flying or even starting the shipping process, there was a problem. You see, because of the focus on maintaining secrecy at all cost, and building the plane on the second floor of an old car factory, a lot of the completed parts couldn't actually fit out of the factory. There was an elevator, but it wasn't big enough to fit some of the parts. Plus, the windows were welded shut, and even if they weren't, they still weren't big enough to fit these parts. So, to get the plane out of the building, they had to knock a giant hole in the wall to the outside, pack the parts into crates, and transfer them over to rail cars. From here, the parts would travel by rail over to Murdoch Dry Lake, known today as Rogers Dry Lake in California, to be tested in remote secrecy. Even then, being at a remote airbase in the Mojave Desert, that almost makes you wish for a nuclear winter, the secrecy would continue as it was being rolled out. It would be disguised as a propeller-powered aircraft. Basically, up until it was time to actually fly, the plane was kept hidden and disguised. Not only would they have a false propeller slapped on the nose, but they also threw a tarp over it. From the outside, it would look like just another prop plane that they were being kind of weirdly secret about. But on October 1st, 1942, the tarp was taken off and the propeller was removed, and the P-59 would take to the air for its maiden voyage to be the first jet aircraft flown by America. Because they weren't too sure about the engines, though, it was a kind of anticlimactic flight. The landing gear never actually came up, and the plane never exceeded an altitude of 25 feet, basically the height of a two-story house. After this flight proved successful in that they didn't crash it, three more flights were made that same day reaching altitudes upwards of 100 feet, or four two-story houses. The next day, they gained even more confidence in the Era Comet and decided to give it a real test run, increasing the altitude from just 100 feet to 10,000 feet over the course of four additional flights. This, though, is where the flight testing would temporarily end, and for about a month until the end of October, the P-59 would undergo maintenance and some small upgrades. One of the upgrades was a makeshift seat for an observer to sit on board and monitor performance. Where the armament would be in the nose, all of that was removed, and in its place, a seat, a tiny canopy, and an instrument panel were all installed. In the meantime, the engines would also receive a lot of attention, as even though there were just nine total flights, the engines experienced multiple problems and suffered damaged parts. Also, the plane just didn't control all that well in these few flights, having a tendency to sway in higher speed flight, 
and the engines, them being new technology, were generally unresponsive and finicky. Shortly after the first prototype would go back into the air in late October, early November, the second prototype arrived on the scene, and displayed similar performance and performance issues. Even with these performance issues, the P-59 managed a top speed upwards of 390 miles an hour, which was relatively solid, especially considering both their inexperience with the engine type and the general finickiness of the engine. But compared to more contemporary propeller-powered aircraft, this speed wasn't particularly impressive or really worth the hassle of these finicky jet engines. For example, in late 1942, the P-51 Mustang was being tested with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and would manage a top speed in testing of 440 miles an hour, and that engine was already well in production, and it was a British engine that Britain had a lot of experience with, using it on several early, mid, and even late war aircraft. If the P-59 couldn't actually outperform a solid but generally run-of-the-mill engine, then what would be the point of using the jet engine? So, in March 1943, 13 improved P-59s were ordered. These new aircraft, designated the YP-59A, would most importantly have improved engines, and they would also have a slightly improved canopy that went from being on a hinge to being a sliding canopy. The original IA engines were to be replaced with higher power I-16 engines boosting the thrust from 1,250 foot-pounds per engine to 1,650 foot-pounds. Ideally, these engines would help boost performance moderately, and in June 1943, the first two improved YP-59A designs were delivered over to the Mojave, while the third was sent over to Britain in exchange for a Gloucester Meteor, a little aircraft exchange program. At first, though, the new designs didn't actually have the new engines yet because they weren't ready. But shortly after their delivery in August, the new engines were ready, installed, and finally took to the air. Despite increasing total thrust by nearly 33%, the top speed only improved marginally up to 409 miles an hour, likely due to these new engines simply not performing to the standard that was promised. On the bright side, though, the planes in the Mojave would actually set an unofficial record of highest altitude reached at 47,600 feet. In this overall new round of testing, extending into late 1944, it was eventually decided to do some head-to-head -head comparisons against prop planes that were currently fielded by the U.S. military, namely the P-51, P-47, and P-38 and this was done in mid to late 1944. It was found that the P-59 performed worse than all of them in speed, control, and reliability. At this point, the P-59 and its jet power was completely inferior across the board. It was also inferior to the Gloucester Meteor that they received from Britain, and Britain did not like the P-59 that they received in return. The top speed of the Meteor 1 was upwards of 446 miles an hour, and while it didn't handle great, it was probably better than the P-59. Britain would fly their P-59 just 11 times, from late 1943 to early 1944, before they handed it back over to America, apparently having seen enough. In all fairness to the P-59, the Meteor at this stage wasn't really better than the prop planes either but it was still better than the P-59. Even with its comparatively poor performance, though, in late 1943, two P-59s were given over to the Navy for testing, presumably to see if it would be a viable carrier plane. As should be no surprise, the P-59 was quickly deemed unsuitable for carrier operations, and instead the two planes that were given to the Navy saw limited use as trainers. So, with the P-59 performing pretty poorly, at best it was mediocre, 
in March 1944, the U.S. military placed an order with Bell for 100 production model P-59As, with another 250 potentially on the horizon. These models would be a bit different than the prototypes, drawing upon their experience to try and improve performance any way they could, outside of the engines, of course. The engines would be the same I-16s, although they were later renamed to the J-31. The wings would be shortened from about 15 meters to 13.87 meters, likely done in an effort to improve speed and maneuverability. To try and improve control and reduce the swaying problem, the tail section would also be redesigned, and a ventral fin was added to the rear of the fuselage. Also, the control surfaces were changed from being just fabric to full-on metal, and the fuselage in general was strengthened. This was likely done because in a series of diving tests in mid-1944, there were two failures. On one, the plane failed to pull up from a dive properly and had to make a belly landing. On another, the tail section just broke off and the entire plane was lost. Not sure of the fate of the pilot, but I would assume he survived. Later on in 1944, presumably due to them realizing that the P-59 wasn't that good of a plane, the initial order of 100 was reduced down to just 50. 20 of them were the P-59A, and the other 30 were a new variant, the P-59B. These only really differed in two areas. One, they had additional fuel tanks in the wings, bringing the fuel capacity from 290 gallons to 356. And the engines were improved a bit, and now had 2,000 foot-pounds of thrust. But this only improved speed by about 4 miles an hour up to 413 miles an hour. The first of these production models were delivered in late 1944. Some of them went over to the Navy for further testing that amounted to nothing, and the rest mainly went to the 412th Fighter Group of the U.S. Air Force. With World War II still ongoing at this stage, and with the U.S. military recognizing that the P-59 was inferior to late-gen prop planes, the P-59 would not participate in combat, but rather would stay on the home front to train pilots in the ways of jet planes. While current jets weren't that great, their far greater potential was recognized still, and the military knew that they were the future. So the P-59 would be useful in teaching pilots how to use jet aircraft that they knew were coming. Just under a year later, in late 1945, just a couple months after the war ended, the P-59 started to be replaced in both training and potential combat roles, whatever they may be. In early 1944, another jet fighter had flown for the first time, in the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star. This fighter design, using a single engine with a thruster that extended out from the tail, would manage a top speed far greater than the P-59 by late 1944, hitting a top speed of 502 miles an hour. Using the experience and knowledge gained from the P-59 and from intelligence gathered on the ME-262 over in Germany, the U.S. managed to pretty quickly design and fly a much better performing jet aircraft. It would also seem, though, that their experience did not improve safety or general engine quality, though, as several pilots would die in the testing of the P-80. Still, though, they had performance that was better than prop planes now, so they were making progress. As of today, of the original 66 P-59s made, including their prototypes, six of them still exist, a pretty surprising number considering their age and low production run but they were historic for American aviation. One P-59A, three P-59Bs, one prototype XP-59A, and one upgraded prototype YP-59A all exist on display, in storage, or under restoration at various museums and Air Force bases across the United States. So, at the end of its career, the P-59 ended up being kind of a dud. An important and historic dud, don't get me wrong, but a dud nonetheless. 
the United States was jumping into the world of jet engines and jet aircraft after not really paying much attention to it. If Britain hadn't been looking into the concept, then it is possible that the development of a U.S. jet fighter probably would have taken until the end of or after the end of the war, with the U.S. getting technology and information from the Germans. If nothing else other than the experience gained from the whole project, we can still look back on the secrecy of the project and get some amusement out of that, especially when they had to knock down the wall of a building to get the plane out, the least sneaky and covert thing they could have possibly done. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. In all honesty, the thing that really annoys me about the P-59 is that gun placement. Just put the 37 mil in the center, one of the 50 cals below or above it, and the other two 50s on either side. There, it's nice and symmetrical, and it looks nice. It's like they did it on purpose just to annoy people. I'm glad the plane was a dud, it got what it deserved. So, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!